Hello and welcome to Twist List, today we are looking at, 10 badass medieval monarchs with obnoxious nicknames, plenty of ancient nobles took on names designed to make their foes run away in wet trousered terror. People like Thorfinn Skullsplitter Reinerson, a 10th century Earl of Orkney, or Vlad the Impaler Dracula, Wallachian prince and vampire prototype. Then, of course, there were a lot of lame kings who got called suitably lame things, Ethelred the Unready of England, Stefan the Weak of Serbia, but there was also a unique class of rulers, who cunningly adopted absurd nicknames to lull their enemies into a false sense of security before brutally erasing them from the face of the planet. These are their stories. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by, King of France. Despite possessing a name that would make a Hogwarts professor blush, Władysław III was about as violent and lecherous as a 12th century nobleman could be. Historians assume that his moniker, Laskanogi, refers to his having unusually long, thin gams. Lacking any contemporary portraits, we must rely on imagination to picture just how spindly Władysław's shanks really were. He lasted only four years before a rebellion of disgruntled nobles ousted him. Spindle shanks spent the rest of his life battling just about everyone, archbishops, relatives, and fellow warlords. His archenemy was his nephew, Władysław the Spitter and the two were so desperate to kill each other that they frequently ignored foreign invasions in favor of avuncular slaughter. The fifth son of Duke Misko the Old of Poland, the leggy lad was exiled at a young age by a jealous half-brother. Fortunately for Władysław, he only needed to wait for his bloodthirsty family to tear itself apart. By 1202, his four older brothers and father had either killed each other or died of post-fratricidal exhaustion, and Poland was his. In his late 60s Spindle Shanks managed to regain the dukedom of Poland, but was kicked out on again the list two years later. Sevilla the horny biggest. old man Alfonso spent the last Knight, two years of his life king much of the given Spanish over to fornication with Leon and Felicia in the he he should have stuck with himself the sex, moniker El Because when so, Spindle Shanks attempted for his to actually spray seduce a girl, rage, she killed him. Granted, he had plenty to be upset about. Leon was squashed between the powerful realm of Castile and the kingdoms of the Moors, and Alfonso spent much of his reign leading drool drenched invasions of one or the other. But it wasn't all war and incest. Alfonso also founded Spain's first university at Salamanca, and convened the Cortes Generales, one of Europe's first parliaments. Furthermore, his son Ferdinand ascended to the throne as King of Castile and Leon, paving the way for a united Spain. He also loved his family, perhaps a bit too much. His marriage to his first cousin, Teresa of Portugal, was annulled by a papal legate. After presumably showering his environs in spittle, Alfonso raised two proverbial middle fingers in the direction of Rome, and married his second cousin, Berengaria of Castile. This time, Pope Celestine III personally intervened to break up the kissing cousins, so the undeterred slobberer just moved back in with Teresa at the third place we have. 5. The Vikings had a particular talent for calling their most imposing leaders names that would seem stupid on a middle school playground. As King of the Isles in the mid-12th century, Olaf ruled over the Hebrides and the Isle of Man. Though he was a couple of centuries late for the Golden Age of the Norsemen, his formidable stature earned him the name Bidlinger, meaning morsel or small snack. Those wanting to be specific called him Kleininger, which meant bread and butter. Returning to his islands, Olaf found them under attack by Arcadian forces. With the help of his badass son-in-law Summerled, Bidlinger massacred the interlopers and built a fleet so powerful that no one else dared mess with him. When one older brother, Lagman, castrated another, Little Snack took refuge in England. Lagman vanished sometime after the year 1100, and Olaf saw his opening. Simultaneously, he assembled a sizable harem and fathered a litter of offspring. After four decades of iron-fisted rule and ongoing fornication, the snack lost his head to a trio of conniving nephews. In fine family tradition, the second his son is, Godred hunted Duke down Poland, the killer cousins, continuing the theme of fecal and slaughtered the third. We have the 8th century Byzantine Emperor Constantine V Copronymus, which means dung named. 
he was never quite cool enough to own the epithet, his enemies seemed to have concocted it by spreading rumors that baby Constantine had soiled the baptismal font. Constantine was an avowed iconoclast, and after defeating a coup led by his iconodule brother-in-law Artabastos, he had the man and his children publicly blinded. He then embarked on a campaign of destroying religious images, lynching abbots, and forcing rebellious monks to marry nuns. This process was so brutal that later chroniclers described Constantine as a pernicious, crazed, bloodthirsty, and most savage beast. At the time, Byzantium was beset from the outside by Arabs and Bulgarians. On top of that, it was racked internally by a struggle between those who venerated religious icons, the iconodules and those they considered heretics, the iconoclasts. If Byzantium's enemies thought all this strife would weaken the empire, S.H. Tynam soon proved them wrong. He invaded Syria, smashed the Arab navy, and slaughtered the Bulgarians in a series of battles. On the way home from a campaign in 775, and finally, though, at number he died one, from a nasty Alfonso case of the swollen legs. When Swiatkanajwalo lived there was in the divine retribution, Bulgaria and was a the point tough some place decades to be, later by digging aside from the usual medieval travails of tossing them into the sea. Famine, and ubiquitous tongue, the Bulgarians had to contend with vicious Mongol raids that their lords were powerless to stop. For one glorious year, the mighty cabbage was Tsar of Bulgaria. The Byzantines sent massive armies to defeat him, but the cabbage outmaneuvered or crushed them. Only when a relative of the old royal family returned and rallied the salad-hating nobility did Evilo flee to his old enemies, the Mongols. Unwilling to help a man named after a vegetable, they murdered him two years later. Evilo dreamed of saving his country, and in 1277 he gathered a peasant army and challenged the useless nobles. Though the rich folk taunted the lowborn leader, calling him Bardavka, Radish, or Lahanas, Kabaji Vilo made them eat those delicious words when he personally cut down the chariot riding Tsar, took his crown, and married his queen. Still, Evilo is remembered for leading one of the first popular uprisings in medieval Europe, and for doing so while saddled with one of the least inspiring sobriquets ever. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. The Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is still around, located in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Now, it's a research facility in the fields of neuroscience, plant biology, quantitative biology, and, not surprisingly, genomics. It was originally opened in 1910 by Charles Davenport, and was known as the Carnegie Institute of Washington. The Eugenics Record Office kept detailed family records that allowed field workers to trace cases of mental and physical defects through a family line. Davenport also conducted studies on the importance of other inherited traits, such as hair and eye color, hair texture, and skin pigments. In addition to physical traits, they also tried to document how chronic diseases such as hemophilia and mental disorders like schizophrenia, along with what they called feeble-mindedness, were passed through a family. Number 4 on the list is, the immigrant problem. Those that supported eugenics looked to immigrants as a problem variable that was introducing all sorts of new and undesirable genetic qualities into the American gene pool. Researchers at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory isolated some of the problems. For example, those with Italian blood were said to be prone to violence. As part of their research, prison and mental institution populations across the country were surveyed to find out just how many members of these populations came from what immigrant group. 
After outbreaks of illnesses like smallpox and cholera in New York City and immigrant hub Ellis Island, the work of the eugenics movement began to gain credence. By 1911, they were operating hand-in-hand -hand with the Immigration Restriction League to influence Congress and the Surgeon General to implement restrictions on immigration. At the third place we have, Better Babies and Fitter Families Contests. As the eugenics movement took off, state fairs across the country started holding Better Babies contests. In some respects, it made sense. Mothers were encouraged to bring their babies to fair judging contests, and in much the same way as livestock was judged, babies would be judged on things like health, weight, and size. While it also helped promote health and good child care, the this isn't so bad part of this entry ends right about there. Better Babies soon evolved into Fitter Families, a contest where whole families would present judges not only with their happy, healthy babies, but with an abbreviated version of their racial pedigree. Doctors would perform examinations on all the members of the family, awarding and deducting points according to guidelines, and families were given a letter grade to show just how eugenics friendly their family was. Winners would be rewarded with medals and trophies in these contests, which remained hugely popular throughout the 1920s. At the second spot is, pioneered by a Stanford professor. The whole thing was started by a Stanford professor named David Starr Jordan. A longtime student of Charles Darwin and the ideas of natural selection and Mendelian genetics, Jordan grew up in western New York and pursued an education in botany and science. After teaching at a number of different universities, it was when he went to Stanford that he truly began preaching his values including education, conservation, and eugenic breeding. After writing several books on the topic of eugenics, he was one of the founding members of the Eugenics Committee of the American Breeders Association and the Eugenics Record Office. Chief among his beliefs was that the upper class of America was being constantly eroded by the lower class, and that careful, selective breeding would be necessary to preserve the country's upper crust. And finally, at number 1, Inspired Hitler's Master Race. We've mentioned it once already in brief, but it's worth revisiting again in greater depth. The American eugenics movement formed the basis for the Third Reich's belief in a master race and their attempts to create one. There was a bizarre sort of mutual respect that went on between American eugenics supporters and the Nazi party. In 1937, the American Eugenics Society issued statements of praise for the work that the Nazis were doing to cleanse the gene pool. For them, the scale on which the Nazis were carrying out their mass sterilization was what they had wanted for America. Original writings of eugenics supporters spoke of cleansing the American population by methods ranging from gas chambers to simply leaving the lower classes to the mercy of the elements or to disease. They went on to lament that American society wasn't ready for such a widespread, sweeping cleanse and saluted the Nazis for doing exactly what they had wanted for their own country. Hitler's fondness for the theories and science behind American eugenics was clear, he would not only quote American texts, 
but use them as evidence to support his madness and to recruit others to his cause. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more then please hit the subscribe button.